more than anything, um, after our yesterday and this morning, like I thought about doing just sort of like some call methods 101, but that seems really inappropriate for this group. And so I thought we might just more kind of broadly talk about qualitative methods in empirical ethics research and in particular um, thinking through some of the strengths and benefits of different qualitative approaches and different ways to structure like our interview guide and how that might um, better set up like the code book development that will come out at the back end. So I just have a few few slides that I thought we could use as sort of like discussion elicitation um, and uh, we can go from there. And I think it's really nice especially to have Faith here because you just like I like I like the way you you talked about laying out your code book um, similarly to the way I do it so that must mean it's right uh, <laughs> so that'll be great um, and very useful um, so what I just thought it might be useful to think about like um, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of qualitative methods to understand research ethics and participant experience and HIV and drug use research compared to quantitative methods. Um, and it's not to say that either is better. Um, we definitely have different people represented in the in the room who primarily do one way or another. But I thought it might just be nice to um, hear from you guys what what you think what you think about this, and especially like some of you have chosen to want to do a qualitative study versus a quantitative study. So it might be interesting to hear you talk about why that was or why that is. Um, one of the strengths is that you're getting a range of perspectives that you know otherwise you might not get. When you, when, you know, when you have a phenomenon that you're trying to explore and study, you're getting a wider, you could potentially get a wider range of nuanced data relative to quantitative methods, um, and arguably at a lower cost, um, and it, it it becomes a little bit you getting way richer data. survey questionnaire for the things that I would be doing. I feel like it's just, it's almost more like a consultation uh, what I'm proposing to do and I feel like it has to be qualitative. And, that, um, and even about like research in general, like I was saying this morning, like if you have, I mean, of course, like both methods are very useful, but quant data can portray a picture that makes people look like very risky or something like that. But you know, when you talk to people, it's when you really understand like uh, you know the explanations behind certain types of behavior mm -hmm. that's I think that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a broader picture mm -hmm. and in particular like for you for both of you in some ways because you're 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 thinking about like how how like how do I do something right like mm -hmm. how do I how do I begin to set something up how do I understand what's culturally appropriate for sort of two different groups of people, mm -hmm. right? Like, because club organizers and club attendees may not be the, they might have very different perspectives around a same sort of end product. And then for you, you're like looking back at time in time to think about, okay, so how do previous experiences shade um, current willingness, right? And it's like the the idea that we would know a priori how to. To measure that, I think, would be really, really difficult with a quantitative methodology. Um, and in some ways, that's similar for both of you as well. Um, we didn't hear weaknesses, so I'd like to hear some weaknesses. Some weaknesses of qual methods. Because I think it's important to know the weaknesses. Of well, that's a weakness, right? That you're not quantifying at a statistically powered level what these experiences or these measures that you're studying are. Um, and so, you know, the quantitative folks, heavy quantitative scholars would, would argue that, you know, it's not enough to just get, you know, a few people's input if you don't, if you can't represent the, the sample. So the, the generalizability yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, but there are other qualitative folks who would argue that's not the purpose of 
qualitative research. Like, oh, we don't, I get it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And so I thought, because in the room, we have people who are thinking about different qualitative methodologies, it might be useful for us to think through how is it, um, like what are the differences in the, in the purpose, strengths, and difficulties of qualitative interviews versus focus groups? And then for maybe each of you to talk about how it is that you chose why focus groups or interviews is the appropriate mechanism for your data collection. I've been listening. <laughs> so, I mean, I would argue it's important to think about the input, like the objective of your study and the disorder in order to decide which type of interview or which type of focus group is most appropriate for your study. So then, I mean, anybody could go. Or the purpose of end up versus. Yeah. So yeah. So for you, for example, like, like as a group, what what's the difference in the purpose between interviews and focus groups? Well, I'm particularly interested in community attitudes, um, like the collective group and using the focus group to get participants to bounce, I'd like to inspire the conversation through other people's conversation, rather than the, the in-depth one-on-one experience where you're just getting people's individual experiences, their individual beliefs, and their individual attitudes. Um, so it just depends on the question. Right. So for you, and I think the main strength of focus groups is the idea that you're really interested in that group dynamic, a collective, like the what the bouncing mm -hmm. off of of ideas, attitudes, the understanding of group norms mm -hmm. and the way that they're created, um, I think is a main strength of focus groups. And so it makes sense that you know instead of saying to one person like, tell me a little bit about how your experience with the healthcare system. And then, right, 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 based right. on that, how do you feel about engaging in the healthcare system, right? Like, it could be really interesting to hear how one person is like, oh, yeah, and me, and me, and me, and then to hear how that collective narrative comes out. Um, whereas, like, it's in you, you're thinking more about individual interviews, right? Yeah, but I know that uh, some of the areas of my interviews can be good in a focus group, too. Um, <coughs> But um, I, I just think that I'm still going to want to have some questions about like uh, their history of going to these clubs and um, their individual like risk perceptions or mm -hmm. what they, um, you know, how they prevent or not, you know, HIV and STDs. So I, don't, I just feel like in a group, it might let some people might just not be comfortable. Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> so there are definitely things, things that yeah. can be complicated yeah. to talk about in a group yeah. setting. Mm -hmm. So that and just like the, the weird thing about it, like, okay, here's a group of people who go to group sex venues. Right. <laughs> I don't know, it's a bit like, I don't know, like how people like, look at each other. In the room. Although to play devil's advocate, A, those people might already be looking at each other in the spaces, and then in Roman's circumstance, he's got a group of people who may not have a good sense of community because the behavior that they are engaging in is illegal. So to be able to provide a space where people can even interact could be useful, cathartic, and really telling. Right. I mean, in the M health world, especially the app based intervention, depending upon what kind of a question that you're trying to answer. Uh, for example, in terms of app development, um, when you when you want to look at what kind of features that you want to put into the app, probably a focus group may be much helpful. But if you're trying to do a usability right. testing, where you have you need to have one to one and you know, one person looking at the app and navigating through the app, probably at that point, one to one may be much better than the focus group. Mm -hmm. so well, it, that's the, you're doing a difference. Right? Yes. 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 Because the, the, during the focus group, right, you want the ideal generation. You want someone right. to think of one right. feature and then see how other people do it. So you're, you, you want more of the bouncing off it right. versus you're not trying to get the individual opinion about it, per se. Mm -hmm. right. And a focus group, the sort of the precondition is that you say semi-publicly identify as a member of the group, which can be, so in some cases it can be great because you may find that you're a member of a group that you don't even realize exists, but in some cases it may be that you don't want others to know that you're in a group, and so you kind of have to balance those two things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think in particular, because I remember reading that your N was like 30 to 40, and I was like, ooh, that's a lot of energy. Um, but I think that it could be useful, especially as you go through your work, to think about 
like the group dynamics because you're at like fundamentally sex clubs are public yeah right mm-hmm. so you're asking people in public spaces to engage in an interview in public spaces mm-hmm. so getting people to talk about it in a public space could also be really interesting mm-hmm. um and I think, and in and, and, and to Derek's point, to hear what one person says and then to see how other people like either shut that down or encourage it could be really useful for you, um, especially for developing the, the intervention and then thinking about the ethical considerations of asking people to engage in likely what's going to be some sort of a public intervention, just walking up to somebody <clears throat> in a space that is a person who's sort of known to be doing HIV prevention work like that's publicly acknowledging something I think you know the strengths we've talked about in terms of the differences between focus groups and and, 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 and interviews but what are some of the difficulties or the challenges that you guys can think of Um, I actually just published a paper on the challenges of doing focus groups with black MSM Um, and one of the things we um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things we talk about um, is managing the managing the size of a subpopulation in that way, um, especially when a, a lot of people know each other already, and so mm. it can kind of become more of like a social thing yeah. rather than um, a professional research thing. Um, also, issues of um, actually with the subpopulation in terms of like masculinity and femininity type of dynamics where people who are more cisgender and quote unquote masculine for the lack of a better term could dominate the conversation in a different type of way in the same way a male female dynamic might exist mm-hmm. so those kinds of subpopulation considerations mm-hmm. um, I, I was thinking about that oh <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so those kinds of things I'm, I'm really thinking through that. right. that's why we keep it Small. So intergroup dynamics for sure. I think in focus groups there is no other place where garbage in or garbage out right, right, right. is more apparent. Right. I think yeah. it's way easier to conduct an interview than it is to conduct a quality a quality focus group. It's just it requires somebody with a lot of experience and finesse. Um, so that I think can be complicated is finding that person um, and training them in the area that you're trying to, to work in. Um, getting eight people in the same room at the same, same time, time. Trying, mm-hmm. trying to schedule a yeah. focus group, yeah. the actual doing it is, is more challenging. Right, way it. harder than just being like, sure, I, you can I get in my car, no problem. You can get in my car. Right, no problem. You can't all fit in the car. Right. <laughs> no, but that that that's real. And then to keep people there. Right, 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 right. You're like, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Yeah, are you going to leave They're ready to go. They get tired. They're bored. Or they're like, we have something else to do. But I'm like, but I said 90 minutes. I have to go to work. They have to leave. Okay, I got to go. Right. Yeah. And then there's like, how do you, and then the ethical considerations about how do you pay people who were there for just a few minutes and then have to go. Or this happened recently to a colleague of mine. He called, he said he didn't want to pay a participant because he never said anything. He said he sat there the entire time. And I was like, but you still have to. He was like really mad. He was like, he just sat there. I was like, that is what you sign up for when you do focus groups. But he was really passionate. He was like, I'm going to call the IRB. I'm like, okay, wow. They're going to shut you down. They're going to shut you down. It's like, if you're really that worried about the 20 dollars, you have other issues, right? You have other issues. So okay, so we so there's a lot of strengths and we you know there's strengths and difficulties for both of those approaches and so really thinking about how your research question and what you think the best way to gather the data to generate the answers to that research question should be you know make ooh. something else that we've been talking a little bit to, about today is sort of you know who who is your sample how are you reaching them what are your inclusion criteria why are those your inclusion criteria. Um, And then importantly, within the auspices of a focus group, then how do you want to stratify um, your sample in ways that make it more likely that um, folks are willing to talk, right? So it may be the case that they're in your perspective that you wouldn't want to put like 
you know, more cis presenting and more effeminate men in the same room. Uh, or it could be the case that you have very specific strategies well, around right. why you would want to do that, right? Right, right, right. right. I mean, right. right. That is not for me to know, but that is like something to, con to consider. And the same might be true for folks who are club owners versus club users and and men w w third gender persons who identify more, who present more effeminately or versus not. I mean, I don't, I don't know, right? But there, there are definite reasons to think through who you want to have in the room in order to promote group dynamics. Um, and the same could be said for your interviewer, which we talked a little bit of earlier. Like it could be the case that having somebody from the community is more appropriate because people are more likely to open up. Or it could be the case that um, the community they're they are identified too closely, and then they're like, "Oh no, we know her. She runs her mouth. We couldn't ever disclose <laughs> that information, right?" And so these are all really complicated things that we need to think through. And I guess the, at the end of the day, you know, feasibility really matters. We have limited time, limited resources, limited staff, limited access to the population. Um, and the thing that's really great about qualitative data is that each person is going to yield an, an extraordinary amount of data. So you can really hopefully get at the idea of thematic saturation with not too large of a sample. So again, I'm sure you guys have, if you, you have thought about these things for your past studies, but I think it's really important to keep this at the fore when you're planning your, LR, your, your um, MRP. So you know, who's going to collect the data? Where is that data collection going to happen? How are you going to recruit people? Who So again, I'm sure you guys have, if you, you have thought about these things for your past studies, but I think it's really important to keep this at the fore when you're planning your LR, your, your um, MRP. So you know who's going to collect the data, where is that data collection going to happen, how are you going to recruit people, who are you going to recruit, how long do you think it will take? So he's going to drill you on that because um, she wants to make sure that you're walking out of here at the end of the day with a feasibly executable study. Um, and a plan for getting your data analyzed and disseminated, not just collected. Um, and then helping you to think through how you're going to ensure confidentiality of your participants, which is a particularly important in focus group discussions where we can't really guarantee confidentiality anyway. Um, so when we think about creating our field guide, you know, the field guide is your instrument you use to generate data to answer your research questions. Interview questions are not your research questions, and I know that sounds really basic, but it's like that thing that everybody forgets, right? <laughs> so the, 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 the research guide, the, the guide is just a tool for collecting your data. Your interviewer is crucial to getting good data, so making sure that it's you or someone that you've trained exceptionally well. Um, there's no written rules around the structure or layout of these guides. It's often a series with sub-questions or probes written beneath them, and they can be set up in a couple of different ways for a qualitative, both a focus group guide and a qualitative interview. So you've got something that's completely unstructured, where you've just got kind of an idea of things that you might like to talk about, but your guide could be completely different person to person. Um, a semi-structured interview where you've got an interview guide and you're asking people like a same set of basic research questions but the probes could vary for everybody based on what the information is that they're giving you or some sort of like standardized open-ended interview guide which may be more like you know open-ended questions on a survey. Um, and so, but, uh, Alexis, what is, what is your experience? You know, it's one thing when you're doing the semi-structured interview guide with, with probes, and you're the PI or co-investigator who knows a lot more about what you might be interested in in order to, to do the probe, and how you train somebody um, who's a research assistant to, to be, you know, what are the risks of, of, of that approach and ha how do you structure it in a way that if you're using a, a research assistant, um, they don't go off on a tangent? I mean, I think the same is true for me. I could also go off on a tangent and miss the things that it is that I really wanted. So I tend to almost exclusively use more of a semi-structured guide, right? And then, and and so, I, you know, and I'll show you um, some examples of some works in progress. Some are 
some of the questions are better than others. But you know, I tend to, to write it out where it's like, here is the domain of things that I'm interested in. So it's physical risks or psychological harms or whatever. Here is my question and then here are some of the probes that might be relevant. And so that's like I have a way that like Good. physically tries to keep me on track, like moving across and then also moving down. Um, and I think that's exactly what's really important if you're having somebody else do the interview. Yeah. That, that's critical. It's also important for me because yeah. there should be some standardization, right? Yeah. Like, it, it should be the case that, like, you're getting people, you're asking people, like, similarly, un similar enough questions in, in, in content that you're getting, you know, that you're able to get a thematic saturation. If you're asking every single person a completely different set of questions, then you're just getting like these one-off answers. One thing that I've done with in training that takes so much time though is um, listen with to, with my RA to their interview and identify the point like the trends and when they did and it's too much and what the domains are and the guide and remind them and like yeah, hey, this yeah. is how you typically do an interview that I've listened to it and now we listen to it together. It takes so much time, but it helps people like oh this is how I this is how I talk but I need to like do it structure like yeah, structure. Be and and, yeah. and and role plays right 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 yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. training training mm -hmm. yeah and a, another thing like you talked about focus groups being challenging like sometimes I struggle depending on the audience for focus yeah. groups and one of the things I started doing recently is having my GA um, she has the guide and she's taking notes and checking off questions mm -hmm. that we've covered mm -hmm. and not. And then sometimes when people go off on tangents, I like turn to her, are there things that we need to, and then it refocuses, and then I can get the questions asked that mm -hmm. may have not been, because it's hard to just cut people off. But I think right, if you right, have right, kind of right. like a diversion, it's right. easy to just say, okay, well, now I have to go to- The next thing. Yeah, yeah Derek, so that he mm -hmm. can make sure that we're staying on track so that we can get you up. Yeah, because I've had like one focus group that's just gone horribly, because I just kind of let people, yeah, yeah talk. Which doesn't mean it wasn't. You didn't learn something, yeah. but you might not have been learning about. Yeah. 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 I think the other thing that's really useful for um, especially like junior research assistants is have them transcribe their own interviews. And then they can, like, so like, then there's a lot of checkpoints, right? Because then there's like the visual cue, right? Like, you should be talking this much and they should be talking this much. And if it's flipped, then you're, you're talking too much, right? They'll also stop saying, you know, and they'll stop saying, um, right? Like, they'll learn to better just to shake their head, you know? Um, <laughs> I think it's true. And I think the other thing it helps people to do is realize where they where they missed it. So that example for that you gave yesterday about like uh, on Thursdays people come over to watch oh, yeah. Scandalous and some guy was just like, oh, people are so scandalous on Thursdays. It's like, no, that's not what. But so your interviewers would pick up on that, right? right, right? right, right and they would right. be like, oh, they misdirected. Right, they missed right. the probe, mm -hmm. the chance to probe, mm -hmm. you know, so whatever. So I think those are really good training opportunities. It helps with coding too. It helps with co and it helps with coding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think all of those things are really useful. And I, you know, if you have the resources, which you may not, but be and having you know two people be able to like code an interview and go back through it and that like ha like it's helpful for reliability, but it's also helpful for again setting up your code book and we'll get to we'll talk about that but like have helping you think through sort of like what were the things that we thought and, and knew we wanted to learn about and then what are the other things that we learned out learned about that were unanticipated. So I guess I would just say, you know, from from my perspective I mostly work in this space, but you guys should be thinking through like what makes the most sense for you and like, you know, it, it matters a lot if you're doing qual purely qualitative work or for you if you're doing more quantitative work, but then you wanted to have a few like really well-placed open-ended questions, mm -hmm. thinking about what that might look like and how, what you might want to ask about. And most importantly, how you would analyze those data. Because if you're not going to analyze them and you're not going to use them, then you shouldn't be collecting them, mm -hmm. right? There's no reason to waste folks' time with questions we're not going to do anything with. And uh, for, for the kind of thing Roman's doing, if you're doing the quantitative with open-ended, do the open-ended come before or after? Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, are they a allowing them to, to think about why they answered a question oh, that's a, a good certain point. way? 
or are they open-ended and then seeing whether the, the kinds of structured questions you, you've asked really match that? Right. I think, yeah, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, I, per, like, generally, I don't necessarily love open-ended questions on a qualitative, or open-ended questions on a quantitative survey. I feel like we mostly don't do anything with them. It's really hard to analyze them. That said, in that sex worker daily diary study that I did, the best question I think I've ever asked was to a group of women, like, what were you thinking about during sex? That was just, that was like an open-ended, what were you thinking about during this event? And then what we got back from women was so insightful and so telling and would have given me a direction for an intervention completely different than what I was um, studying. And so I think that like if you can come up with those one or two like really sort of like thought provoking something that people are going to want to tell you because they don't get to talk about it anyway, especially if it's a group of sex workers, like no one ever asks them what they're thinking about when Did they're you know having that was going to be a great question when you wrote it? No, I was just like being a voyeur. I was just like, I really want to know what women are thinking about. <laughs> and then, uh, I the, my the, like of all of the things. So there were some things I don't around. Really want to know. I have to leave I want, room. Yeah. So there were some things around pain and pleasure, but mm -hmm. the the thing that was most salient was about work mm -hmm. and about needing to get like a real job mm -hmm. or things like that. So like these I sex work through yeah. Workers? These were sex. These were what. They were, they were events where they were set being sex workers, not events where they were having were, sex with someone else. So there's both. So there was, we have both kinds of events, mm -hmm. sex workers having sex. So we get pain, we get pleasure, and then we also get um, the, all, like the pain, the paid, the payment right. stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I walked away from that study being like, oh, I don't know why I'm doing HIV stuff. I should just be doing vocational stuff because right. vocational stuff is HIV stuff. What a waste of a whole career. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like, wow, way to really miss that. <laughs> So someday I'll have a vocational intervention. Someday, if I can figure it out. So anyway, um, other things to think about that I think can be really useful, um, which it seems like both Faith and I tried to do, was we looked at the principles from the Belmont report, right? There's the three overarching principles. And then we think about the different kinds of risks and benefits that they, they talk about within the Belmont report, so psychological, physical, legal, social, economic, and trying to think about how these different um, themes can guide your questions around understanding potentially risks, benefits, and that are both anticipated and or experienced. And so I think that um, keeping those things just like up front while you're creating your guides can be really, really useful for us because we're so new to this field. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other, and, and uh, you may have talked about this yesterday about other components to the Belmont report and that I think is particularly important to, to what some of you are doing, like relationality. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in the Belmont report yeah. and also Shearer's article, you know, the article I wrote and then Shearer's article, relationality was a, a very important construct that, you know, is really not within the Belmont report. And then fiduciary responsibility, right, mm -hmm. is something else in terms of how do they see you as a professional and what do they think your responsibilities are that may or may not be the same. Right. As a friend, as a somebody else. And, and you don't have to be asking that th those questions. Those assumptions may just come across. You know, like I was talking about in my study where they, where they say, you know, how can I trust that they're going to do good research and have my voice if they're doing something illegal like I do? You know, thing, things like that that you don't anticipate. But, but, you know, those are also principles, I think, that, that have become increasingly important. And integrity. Mm -hmm. That that would be a third that's not included specifically in the Belmont report, although they talk about it. Yeah, so I would say that like, you know, coming up with that list of like constructs or domains that you're interested in to include some of these things, to include the other things that Silly is going to be talking about, can be really, really useful because otherwise it may be hard to think through like concretely, like what are the different like shades of gray within these like ethical quandaries that people may find themselves in. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, just reminding you guys, interview questions and research questions, not the same. Um, and then I think importantly, you know, for a 45 interview, you might just have five or seven questions mm -hmm. and then a lot of probes. So we all, I feel like in qualitative stuff, you know, less is more because otherwise it could feel like you're trying to rush through 
an interview and you're not really giving people the time to tell you their story and their story is like the whole reason why you're even in the room. Um, but again, so no real rules on how to set and stuff question other than probably not best to start with the most sensitive questions. You want to have some sort of a logical flow. Um, yeah. And then you might have a bunch of different probes. So this is from my friend Allie, and she, you know, just an example of like, you know, here's her research question. How does adolescent motherhood affect adolescent girls' experience in high school in South Africa? Like, that's what she wanted to know, right? And then her interview questions are specific to the women. So can you tell me a little bit about your experiences in school before you felt pregnant? And then how did you feel about school as a probe, or what were some of the things you disliked or liked about school, right? So just keeping in mind, Interview questions, answer research questions. Um, and then I thought it might be useful um, just for all of us to think about, like, what are some of our favorite ways to get people talking? Um, so Tom Inouye is this great, like, MD researcher. Um, and I was his assistant way back in the day. And he has this device where he asks people to tell them a story. And I love it. Like, so imagine for you, because it's easy for me to think about it, but so about, you know, think back to the last time that you were in a healthcare setting where you felt like someone treated you differently because of how you present, right? You're not defining differently. You're not defining what present means. Could you, so think back to that. All right, you're there. Great. Where were you? Who were you with? Why were you with the doctor? Could you go ahead and tell me that story, right? And then you get that person really trying to tell you this story from their past. And I think that like give, getting getting people to tell you a story is a really lovely way to have people bring you into their lives. Um, I don't know. I'm, we. What are some of your guys' favorite ways to get people talking? Yeah, I do that a lot. Walk me through it. Um, like take me like so watching a movie of your life. I also um, with I also try not to probe too much. I actually stay silent because the participant gets uncomfortable with the silence, and then they start talking more. That so, is so <laughs> true. So, so they like I'm like I know like I just sit there and I'm just like that was therapy one on one. Okay, 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 okay. So yeah, I'm not a psychologist. No, but that's really <laughs> that's useful. Weird. It, it Don't gets so feel it the gets uncomfortable. So they just so keep, they keep talking. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. They just keep that's talking. True. Especially if I don't know what to probe on, uh -huh. it just helps. It just helps. So let's go around. What what would be what would you be your icebreaker, Andy? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, start with something like a very like a very sh like short question that is like very like <clears throat> non directive So say it's just to uh, it's like party organizer. How how did you start organizing these events? Like you know, like, that's okay. <laughs> you know, and then see what comes up, and hopefully, like it's all the whole story. Mm -hmm. or, like, so, yeah, start with a, a question that is very small, or you know, how do you feel about this? Just you know, uh, and I even asking like, what makes you feel good about this? What makes you feel bad? Just like how do you feel? See what comes up and then yeah. yeah, starting with a very open question sometimes yeah. can be really good because people will open mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. and then you can get much more focused with the yeah. next series of questions. Yeah. Especially good in the focus group. Mm -hmm. But it's so funny in psychology you're always very careful about using the term feel as yeah. opposed to what do you think what about you think? this or what are your thoughts about this? Because hmm. Feel has very different mm -hmm. meanings mm -hmm. for different people. Some would think it's an emotional reaction, <laughs> others think it's it's just another word for thought. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? So you want to be a little more, you know, um, than anyhow, yeah, that's just in our field that that's always mm -hmm. been, been something. So I mean, what's a good icebreaker that you use? Yeah, I mean I think I'm thinking more of therapy, but um, <laughs> you know, things like how was your day? Mm -hmm. Um uh, I, I, if it was therapy, I would say tell me what brings you here today, but it doesn't really make sense because I'm often those types, those types of kind of open-ended um, things that just ask them to kind of reflect 
not necessarily specifically on what I'm going to approach them about, but yeah, disarming, making people comfortable with you as the interviewer. So, yes. you know, it, it raises an interesting point, which you've raised before, which is this blending. It's sometimes mm -hmm. hard because you were there for yeah. this. And, yeah. and so asking, how was your day, is, is that it's potentially right, misleading right, 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 right. as to where the rest of this oh, huh, interview is I mean, going yeah. to go? It's, it, huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I always feel like, hmm. as you can see, I'm always troubleshooting, you know, but even myself, I'm always like, gee, how can my well-intentioned question be misinterpreted by somebody or, or lead, you know, down? So it's just always good to say, what's the worst thing that could happen with this particular item, you know? And then... <laughs> so how would your day someone might, like, what might you expect? That they might think the rest of the interview is going to be more about therapy. exploring them. Mm -hmm. It's more uh -huh. personal. That's and this is not it's more therapy. therapy. Right, exactly. And or how does your day kind of answer? Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. you know? Which could be yeah. a lot. You know, remember the, the one you went, walked into. Right. You asked, how was your day? Your whole interview could have been. That's, yeah. yeah. The other day was yeah. rough. It ended. Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, that's true. I guess I was just thinking also about just. To me, I would have thought about that as being a little innocuous, like mm -hmm. kind of like where are you from, right? Like, right. but yeah, what I mean, yeah. yeah. well, yeah. even that you gotta have a nimble, qualitative <laughs> interview <laughs> skills because <laughs> even though I've asked people like, what what you just asked? Where are you from? Where are you from? And people will say, well, you know, I was abused as a child, <laughs> and, <I> was, <laughs> and they become so because yeah. they know they're coming ultimately for a research. <laughs> Experience and so the I mean, laughter is from like, the fact that that is a response. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know. So it's just like, you gotta just, yeah, okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. you have to do it for consent. Yeah. So you're yeah. Yeah. introducing a study mm -hmm. and they know what you're gonna ask. It's like itself will just say, so this, as I just mentioned, let's say they've signed a consent, the study's gonna be about X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just tell me your initial thoughts about it. In other words, mm -hmm. yeah. there's a risk in getting, right. like sometimes you wanna say, tell me about your day, because it, it's a way of easing them into rapport, mm -hmm. especially right, right, if like, right. you were working right. with kids or younger people. Mm -hmm. But you could just start put it out there, this is what we're talking about, what's your initial thoughts, and then that leaves you open to start right. probing in those mm -hmm. directions. Or, they or may still say, my initial yeah, thoughts, I was abused as a child. Some people, you just got to be yeah. ready. And then you say, <laughs> that's that's right. Right. Yeah. Or asking them, you know, have you ever been in a research study? Mm -hmm. Or what are your yeah. thoughts about research? Yeah. I, I remember you said, the kids, yeah. Like, like, yeah. Like, yeah, they never knew what it was. And they said, well, did you ever enter survey online? That's kind right. of like mm -hmm. a research, you know yeah. what I mean? Like just getting getting them to talk about it. So that they're in the ballpark, right. that they're, they're headspace, and, and they don't feel disappointed mm -hmm. that all of a sudden you're talking they're about not their therapy. Yeah. Right, 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 right. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah I like that. Yield some data. Like right, exactly. Research yeah. in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Roman, how are you going to make people feel comfortable answering your survey? <laughs> Which is this very similar, you know, except it's not open and it's not a qualitative question. And in the in the qualitative interviews I've done I after, as a formative research for this particular uh, grant, I usually ask what gets in the way of getting that. So mm. they yeah. just start yeah. to mm. give out ideas uh -huh. and we I'm go stealing go. all of it. <laughs> That's for the qualitative but in terms of qualitative, um, I guess um, I'll just give I uh, that was you, the, the slides you presented, giving them a scenario of how the research is going to be, I mean, the app is going to be, and how it will help people to, you know, get from one step to another, uh, you know, provide a risk assessment, and now it's a time to go to the lab to get the blood work done, and now it's time to go to the clinic, uh, go to the pharmacy to get the uh, prescription filled. I think providing them the step-by-step the -step process in the video might give them a better sense of how the study will be. Right. The only thing I would say is, given you're asking them for their opinion, I wouldn't say it will. We hope it will. We hope, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, it's right. very interesting because just saying it will changes the way they're going to respond because there's a response bias there that, that you yeah. kind of opened up. And then the other thing I'd say, what our experience with, with the videos is, the videos are really important, but then you have to repeat it in the actual mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're not gonna remember everything, it's just, it, it allows them to frame it and understand, but then you might say, remember we talked about the first step of this is to do this, 
you know, so just make sure that it's in the beginning of each. It's also really program. important, especially in quantitative research, that in your pilot phase you find out how they're hearing things. Yeah. Because I once did a study on injection environments, and we said, where do you inject? And everybody in the pilot phase said, they're in the Yep. And it was like, it didn't occur to us. We knew we were talking about it, right? right? If we had not asked and put that survey out there, it would have been. Like you need to, and so you can ask directly, how did you hear this question? What did you think we're asking for? Just with a few people, because the misconceptions can be right there. Yeah. Oh, so then just in terms of talking about probes, so then you could ask people specifically to follow up on things that you know of our interest. So like, what did you mean when you said, or you know, you said X, Y, and Z are major problems in your community. Are there other problems? C can you tell me more? I like that. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you tell me more? Um, and then there's the indirect types of probes. So probes to summarize and confirm. I heard you say X. Oops, I heard you say X. Can you tell me more about that? Anything else? And then the uh-huh, and then the silence, which you know, just thinking back to my own, it's not qualitative research, but I had this like advisor back in the day of, and he was just like the most silent person. And it's true, like he would just sit there silently, like being introspective, thinking about whatever brilliant thing he was going to say next. And like, I've never cried in anybody's office more. <laughs> and it was just like, just <laughs> silence. You're just like, <laughs> and then they just look at you yeah. and you're just like, yeah. <laughs> so you know, I think that, that when he was having for dinner. Yeah, he wasn't thinking about me. <laughs> but it's true. I think that like, I don't know that I use silence enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's a great. I, I think also, but if, if, if this is a how you're thinking about this, but not to ask yes, no questions. Yeah, yeah for yes, sure. Yes, 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 no. Yes. And, then, and then you're really in trouble. Because mm -hmm. so then you're like, that's not open So all it's what you think about, right? How, you know, other terms that are asking them for. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask about your note taking during the interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I don't know that I do a great job of taking notes, to be honest. I feel like I. I really try and be present and so yeah. I, I I maybe take notes you know like I jot down a couple of things either that I want to circle back to with right. that person or something to help me remember something else that I want to ask the next person mm -hmm. I tend to take more notes right after, after. that person leaves yeah. and then I ask the people who are transcribing to also take notes mm -hmm. and so then we sort of triangulate those two sets of field notes mm -hmm. But I think that like you can get so distracted and miss what people are saying. So. Sometimes I pretend to take notes because guys um, yes. think they're saying something right. Oh, and or important. They, and, and oh, right. Yeah, and then they want to keep telling you that. Uh, so I'm not really taking so notes. Like, sometimes you're like they, spaghetti. I'm like, I'm like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I got ten more minutes on this. Like yeah. you know what I mean? Like it, yes. it's scribble. So I do that. What about are you all of those of you who are using who are doing content? Are you all going to to audio? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. If this focus group, definitely the notes become really yeah. important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's also in a focus group then, whereas in a qualitative interview, you might want to limit the amount of people that you have in the room. I think in a focus group, it's nice to have like one or two people taking notes. Yes. Yes. One person who's right. keeping you yes. on task, one person who's sort of writing things down about the dynamics and who's saying what, especially if you have a group that's intimately connected mm -hmm. and they're passionate mm -hmm. and they're excited and they're talking over one another mm -hmm. and they're not doing a good job of like following the rules. The um, other thing I do is it's, because like you were saying, in a focus group, one of the things you find in a transcript is that one person's doing most of the talking right, and you right, think right. this is a brilliant idea and then you realize it's the same person right, that right, said right, this idea. Right, this right, is not right. entirely general across the group. Mm -hmm. So, but unless you can know everybody's voice. And so a lot of times, usually what I do to keep out an enemy, I give them color buttons. Mm -hmm. they, they can choose their color buttons and everybody calls each other a color and mm -hmm. they get very happy about it and people call themselves stripe, whatever they want to do. <laughs> but that, you know, I try to remind them, please just say your color. And if they don't, I always just, as they're talking, I'm going stripe, or okay. blue, mm -hmm. right. you know, yeah. green, whatever. But I, I find that really important in focus groups okay. because you can't depend on the voice. Okay. You get confused. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the okay. note taker mm -hmm. may miss it too because, like, like you said, it's so dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. And I, it, again, along the lines with having the note takers because they're so important. So, like, you know, GA sometimes, like, they might not take taking notes as an important. But um, one of the things I've also had in focus groups is, 
I've had them go through each question if we have like 10 minutes at the end and they kind of summarize and that's super yeah, helpful. That's helpful. Yeah, that's really helpful. And again, it has to be a great note taker who can kind of synthesize like, and then it's like, do you have anything else to add? Did I miss any perspectives for this question? That's actually and the a, next really question. a really good idea. I always like give a handout, which I will have oh, I think and then have people write in. I mean, that's a good idea so too. No, but summarizing it. is a great yeah, idea. It's like getting a second focus group out of your, like the limitation of focus groups is you only can do a certain mm -hmm. number of them. Yeah, but, give, but giving a brief summary doesn't mm -hmm. have to be a lot. Lets you get so much more data from people in that last mm -hmm. ten minutes. That's a great idea. Cause yeah, because I, I, I do the same thing with my one on ones. Like oh, I say, what I don't care how long it's been, how long the interview is, and how much crying and tears they shed. I always say, what else have we not talked about that will help me learn about them? Mm -hmm. Everybody always has something else to say, no mm -hmm. matter how long that. And, and then that becomes another what thing I ask about, about right? a question about the interview mm -hmm. that I didn't even have a question about. So nice. that's a good one. Yeah. 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 I, see, what, yeah. Else, what else do we get? I feel like I always think we've covered a lot of ground. Is right, there anything right, else right. you'd like to say? No. No. Exactly. That's no. why you but say I'm, what else. What else? Not, is there yeah. yeah. Else? What else have we not yeah. talked about? I think that's a good point. But also, if you give people a summary and you say, this is what yeah. I heard you say, mm -hmm. did you know, right. tell me the ways I didn't get it right. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, tell yeah, me yeah, the ways yeah, I yeah. did get it right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good idea. We're asking, you know, what what would you have wanted me to ask? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. What else? What should I ask the next people? Because I know y'all gotta go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then and then just tell your GAs and RAs not to do this. Right. Because that happened all okay. time, and we're listening to these tapes, and it's like, oh my what god, what is that? Okay. What is that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. 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 I had an experience. I did a online survey. With parents, I did all these measures, and then I just decided to, you know, toss in a couple of open-ended questions after learning about qualitative analysis. And so I put in a couple of open-ended questions asking parents, "What would you do if this your adolescent came home drunk or high, and you know, drug of choice, and different things?" And to my surprise, people wrote pages. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, when this happened to my when my oldest son, this is what we did, and he ended up having a problem. Like, I got mm -hmm. so much. I was shocked. I mean, even parents who didn't have it were listing, like, you know, like kind of that they walk through it in their minds that it was important to them about it. And this is something that parents think about with kids, teenagers. And they wrote a lot. And so I would say, even when you're thinking about doing a survey about online, think about how you can ask a question and make maybe some, some open ended questions that would elicit people really being able to share with you and writing your experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we were talking about yesterday. We're talking a lot about how to get data, but the flip side is, are, are there techniques or strategies you use to rank people in? Mm. Because sometimes you can do an interview, I mean, I've seen, especially when you hire new people, that they come back with an interview and it's three hours long, mm. and you're like, oh my god, like, something happened. And two oh, of those hours were about, like, Wendy's and Dairy Queen, yeah. and you're like, we're right. definitely right. not Well, but about maybe that. you're studying Wendy's <laughs> right. and Dairy Queen. Yeah. Yeah. It's a soft serve compared right. to studying, no. but, but, like, are there, are there just quick and dirty things you do that you've learned to say that are not offensive but redirect or? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's also, so that's a great question and it's also when do you do that? Right, right. Because right? Right. if somebody's in the middle of tears, you you know, right. it's hard to, it's so hard to someone's tent going, going off on a tangent, <laughs> but, which isn't a tangent to them, it's just you have an idea of what you want to get out of this 90 minutes or 60 and minutes and they. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I mean, I mean things I think you can, you know, things just like, wow, that's a really, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it like that. Can we circle back to that later? My, to right. right. <laughs> my, I don't know if you remember. My question was this. Or, yeah. yeah, or I try to really stay focused on the research questions. Like, tell me how, because it could be meaningful to in their experience. I always do like, well, how does that relate to that's, this? Uh -huh. Like, yeah. oh, that's super. Like, I get super excited about what they're talking about. Like, going <laughs> to Dairy Queen, even though that has nothing to do with HIV prevention, but it might. So, how does that relate to HIV prevention? Uh -huh. Like. Oh, I go before I go on my prep visit. Or right. I go before, I, you know, it's my so treat. Like, my no, treat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. So I, I don't know. So okay. you know, so that's how I do that's it. That's a good and point. Also starting with something that is like affirming about like, oh, yeah, it's yeah. so great to hear about your queen. Like, like, oh, you go to one of them. Yeah, also right. Yeah. 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 But we've only got ten minutes left and I have a whole lot more than I want to discuss with you. Right, right, right. We want to get you out on time. 
having time. Yeah, that's good. I want to respect your time. I want to respect your time. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. and I have a lot of mm. questions. So it's just. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, too, giving them time stamps throughout the interview can be helpful too. Yeah. In so terms of helping to deal left. with their fatigue or you mm. knowing that you're mm. over time, like we're halfway through. Or mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's been a big change in quantitative interviews that people used to look at the pages you put in your Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, yeah. now yeah. when it's online, you don't know. it's much, yeah. much yeah. more out of control. Unless it gives you that you so know, yeah. bar. Right, 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 right. right. But if you're doing like an interview on an iPad, like that's right. right now, the right. one person has no idea that oh, you're, right. Right. which definitely has oh. an impact. Mm. That's true. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that? Well, and then again, with the populations that we work with, I think they're, for me anyway, the people who use and who may eat a cup of coffee or to smoke a cigarette or to do whatever, I mean, right. being prepared that that is the context of their lives. Mm -hmm. So it may be the case that, like, people need to take that break and you're like, we, I have, you know, and just, you know, being aware that that is part of logistics and they may not come back or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or that may make you late for your next person or whatever it is, but just being, you know, being aware that, you know, it could be the case that people's phones keep ringing and you want them to, you know, you might ask and they say things like, I'm getting evicted today and I need right. to be able to talk to X, Y, and Z person. So then, and then you've got the additional complications of making sure that you're always shutting off your recorder, yeah. that you're teeing back up who you're talking about when, you know, so it's a lot. Alexis, have you ever had, since you've worked with um, drug users, do people ask you personal questions like, mm -hmm. do you use PrEP? Yeah. Would you mm -hmm. use PrEP? Mm -hmm. Are you HIV positive? Like, mm -hmm. I never know how. Yeah, and I'm probably like jam JAMA in that I, I probably disclose too much. Um, okay. That, but that's like, I mean, I, you that's who I am as a person. And so I'm an oversharer, you know, and I think that, and so like I probably, you like have to walk that line. I did take PrEP. Um, and so I could talk about all about like, you know, prep stigma and prep pharmacy stuff. But I mean, I took it specifically because I wanted to be able to talk to my research participants about what it was like for me to ask my doctor for prep and to go get it from the pharmacy, all of which had a lot of stuff and then to be able to talk about side effects. And so like, but that was just, you know, like that's who I am. That's who I am. And so then I, I, I would disclose that and I would share it and I would say things like, you know, we're going to call you in two weeks to ask you about your, the side effects that you're experiencing. And if people say, I'm really scared about it, it's like, I get it. The literature shows that most people who experience, you know, side effects lose those after a month, and I didn't have any. You should write about it. Like, I this think is amazing. I think you should. That is yeah. awesome. I want to take prep now. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. You definitely write about it. Okay. That's a surprise yeah. for Saturday lunch. <laughs> yeah. Everybody gets prep. Yeah. Yeah. I, all taking prep now. Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought about it. But it was important to yeah, me, right? It's yeah. the same thing as, like, I have all of the, I have a bunch of cis women who work for me, and they, they have to teach other women how to do, like, the, uh, STI, site-specific STI swabbing, mm -hmm. and so how do you tell somebody how to put something in their tush or down their throat or in their vagina if you've never done it? Right. Um, and the drawings are stupid, so all of the girls practice, and mm -hmm. like, and that's just, I mean, that's just the way we do it. But it relates to that whole insider outsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, so you kind of help to, yeah. I think and that's, also that's, how you can get inside if you're on the outside. Right, right. Yeah. 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 yeah, but there's also, but so yeah. like, that's a really good, that's an example of something I think I've done well. There are other times in which I have probably like over disclosed or made a joke that in some way like with like I, I can remember I mean this isn't a uh, let me preface this by saying this is inappropriate uh, <laughs> but like so I was sitting with a woman who's a sex worker and we were sitting in our house and we were talking about stuff and we were just talking about the ways that, she was talking about the ways in which like women and, and pe all people can engage in like in trading, right? And that we trade things for things, it's the way that life works. Life right. right, and so I was talking about, you know, it was winter in Indiana and I needed a driveway shoveled and I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I was married, so I happened to be talking about my husband, but like, you know, it, it, and I never really thought about, like, she and I shared a laugh, and it was fine. But then, like, in the context of a qualitative class, like, I shared a tr an excerpt from the transcript, not thinking about the fact that that was in there. And I, you know, so it was a little embarrassing. I still stand by it, but I think it's an example of, like, insider, outsider. Like, I believe in trade.
mean, like, I mean, I think, right. you know what I mean? But, like, I don't know that that, that was an appropriate, it wasn't, I don't think it was appropriate, right? right? right. Because it's not, it's not the same. Our lives aren't the same. Our work is the same. Like, right. 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 So, right. Right. needless to say, sometimes I do it well and sometimes not so much. I mean, I don't think she was offended, but that's not the point, right? Like, when I reflect back on my own behavior in the context of conducting research, do I think that was okay? And it's like, no, probably not. I think you have to think of that boundary, and this is part yeah. of being a nimble interviewer, is you have to, in, in the moment, implicitly determine whether that person is asking you a question just as a rapport building, do yes. you have kids, yes. versus right. whether that person is, is inadvertently yes. eliminating a boundary that you need to do the interview. Yes. And the problem is, you can't plan it because there are an infinite number of things that people can say or do. And so you just right. have to kind of somehow teach yourself or learn through things you then say, maybe I would or wouldn't have done this, to just get a sense of, now if they're asking you 16 questions, eventually you could say, I want to focus you know, on, you. on you, but yeah. it's really hard to know that in that moment. I mean, you might feel it, and this is why face-to-face -face interviews, there's really no, a Skype interview, it's harder to do this, a yeah. phone interview, it's harder to do this. Like when someone says that, right. you're reading all those signs, but it's really hard, because it's not like disclosure is wrong. And it's not like disclosure is right. So you, right. there's no answer like in class to say, here's what you should do. Mm -hmm. Except maybe to say, be careful, because mm -hmm. you and can't to, and unsay something. Yeah, right. and, and to call yourself into question, right? Like, you know, and it's been a hot minute since I've transcribed an interview. And even at this point, like, I'm not even doing a ton of coding, right? Like, I have folks who are doing that, and then we're still right, you know. And so it, I think it calls into question you know, what, taking a step back and going back more into being your own researcher because it's in the retrospect that you can can think about the way that you, what you said or how you said it. And if you're, you know, if you're just doing the interview, if you're relying on other people to do that, um, it's hard to ref be, you know, to reflect. That's a really great example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was really was pleased by first year when I handed that out to a bunch of <laughs> doctoral <laughs> <therapy. laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I think you know you want to you want to be nimble. So you want to think about having some probes, but also not being so focused on your guide that you're not listening to people, and that you say yeah. something stupid yeah. like, "Oh, people are scandalous on Thursdays." <laughs> like he could have easily have just said, "What do you Tell mean? Me more, Tell right? me more about that. <laughs> what do you mean people come over for that. scandal?" <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and then I think just I think this is the last. Part and we, we still you can decide if she wants to do this or we should go on and take our break. But I mean, I would just think about the importance of setting up your guide to get at the things that you like a priori think are important while still leaving space to elicit the emergent, right? And that I think if you do that in your interview guide, then that will better set you up when you get to developing your coding framework. I think that's that. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just one thing uh, before we go into the next, but I, I do think also, especially when you're training research assistants, sometimes you, you, if somebody's already answered a question that you haven't gotten to yet, and it's really important not to be insulted <laughs> and ask them the same question, they, they just, you know, so, and, and trying to train your research assistants to also, you know, not repeat themselves, but maybe as a person describing, say, you know, or I, I think you've already answered this. Is there, a, you know, is there anything else? Could you just tell me that confidentiality is so interesting that I just want to make sure we've gotten everything. But you know, got to be very careful because when we stick to our uh, interview, people get mad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they say, yeah, exactly. It's it's insulting. So okay, so let's take a five minute break.